All right. It's time, everybody. It's time. Come on in and have a seat. Good morning, Karis Bible College, first and second year. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Excellent. Welcome to all of those who are watching by live stream this morning. Guys, we are super privileged this morning to have a special guest with us, Happy Caldwell, Pastor Happy Caldwell. And so Pastor Happy is the president and founder of Victory Television Network. Anybody ever watched anything on Victory Television? Yep. So that's uh, Pastor Caldwell, and he's also the founder of Agape Church and was the pastor of that church for about 30 years or so, in uh, 35 years in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so uh, Pastor has a heart to raise up shepherds. And so uh, I just want to encourage you. He's also the author of three different books. One of them, The Heart of the Pastor, is the one that I'm most familiar with. And if you feel called to lead and to shepherd, I would highly recommend... Uh, that you you listen to that or you read that book. And so, guys, this is going to be a great hour for us, and I believe there's going to be an impartation that's going to take place from what, without a doubt, can be considered a general in the faith. And so, guys, please help me give uh, Karis Red Hot Welcome to Pastor Happy Caldwell. Well, thank you. What a blessing. How many of y'all are here today? (laughs) Good. I'm glad you're here. And um, we're glad we're here. Uh, One of the few times that we've been here where it wasn't snowing. So God answered our prayers. (laughs) Uh, In just a minute, I'm going to introduce my wife and she's going to minister to us in song. But uh, I'd like to get to know each one of you all. I can do it personally in the third year ministry class that I teach, but here it'd be a little difficult. So uh, at the count of three, one, two, three, I want everybody to shout out where you're from. One, two, three. I've probably been there. (laughs) My wife's coming at this time and uh, she's the one that she and her mother prayed me into the kingdom of God. I got saved at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee, at the old Ryman Auditorium. My wife was a professional singer. I was not. And when we started the ministry, we started singing. I embarrassed her many times because I would forget the words to the song. But I would just make new words up. But that didn't work because she was singing singing the right words and I was singing... Uh, the wrong words. But anyway, we made it. God knew our hearts and, and uh, we've uh, been married 52 years this year and we've been in, the, been in the ministry 48 or 49 of those, of those years. Anyway, she's my favorite singer and I asked her if she'd sing a song this morning to kind of get you. I don't think you need any help getting started. They're all pretty. But anyway, this is a, a song off of one of her CDs uh, and it's called I'm a believer. Go. Life is what you make it. Just embrace it. Even through the heartache. Sweeter days are yet to come 
done. Sometimes I come home uh, from the office and she'll be in the uh, living room with the CD cranked up, just singing along. Uh, you, I get ministered to by her singing. You know, we grew up in the 50s and uh, that's when rock and roll, not rock, but rock and roll uh, was very popular. And uh, Jeannie was born in Memphis and she lived in Mississippi and in Little Rock and that's where we met. But uh, as a teenager growing up uh, and she was singing professionally, uh, she met and introduced a new Elvis Presley. And you know, if you ever go to Graceland, they won't let you go upstairs on the second floor, which was his bedroom. And um, T.G. Shepard, who was country and then rock and roll, was a good friend of Elvis's. And if you have Sirius XM radio, you can watch or listen to the Elvis channel. And on Friday afternoons, they have a uh, interview section with some of Elvis's friends and whatever, the ones that are still alive. And they ask them different questions about, you know, their friendship with Elvis. And, and Jeannie's told me just a little bit about uh, when they would like, if they wanted to rent and go out, the whole group, the Memphis Mafia and everybody, they'd go out to a movie. They'd just rent the whole movie theater. And Elvis loved uh, to give people things. He loved to bless people. He was a very generous man. And uh, if he'd hear somebody needed a car, he'd give them a car. And when they came out, when the, the Cadillacs came out with the first push button windows, she said he was fascinated. He'd just sit there and watch that window go up and down, <laughs> up and down. Well, we were listening to T.G. Shepard. And the reason I'm saying this to you is because of her singing and how an impact music has on people. Uh, Elvis told T.J., he said, come on up uh, and upstairs with me. And T.J. was a little bit uh, you know, hesitant because nobody goes up there. And he went up and Elvis was sitting on the bed reading his Bible. And he told TJ, he said, you know, I've been studying the Bible. And he said, I'm called to preach. And he said, I'm thinking about quitting the music business. And TJ said, uh, and this was at the height of Elvis's career, said, oh, you're thinking about quitting the music business? Yeah said, I'm called to preach and think about quitting the music business. He said, and I have found out in the Bible that I have an anointing to lay hands on people and see them healed. He said, I can pray for people that have headaches and every time they're healed. He said, if you don't believe me, ask Priscilla. He said, I've prayed for her many times since she had a headache. So he asked her, he said, Priscilla, is that right? She said, it sure is. He said, if I have a headache, I'll just call Elvis. And he comes over and lays hands on me. And he said, she said that the headache is gone. Now, can you imagine Elvis Presley behind this pulpit <laughs> preaching to you? Can you imagine him preaching to the world? If he was in a conference center, if he was in an auditorium, if he was in a church, you wouldn't be able to get the people in there. You know, you may be surprised when you get to heaven who you see and who you don't see. John, Wayne, Brother Hagin told us that John Wayne wrote him a letter. How many of you know who John Wayne was? Yeah. If you don't know who John Wayne is, that's almost un-American. <laughs> and John wrote Brother Hagin and said, I want to thank you for your books. He said, I've got your book, Right and Wrong Thinking, and it has changed my life. And I read his biography, and at the end of his life, uh, he did as Jesus come in his heart and was born again. So when you get to heaven, you might see Elvis up there singing and John Wayne might walk up to you and say hello pilgrim <laughs> <laughs> well we're all looking forward to going there and uh, if you're turning your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5 we're going to find out what qualifies you to go to heaven I want to talk to you just a little bit this morning about the victory that overcomes very familiar passage of Scripture, 1 John 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God 
overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, our faith. Now, the qualifier to be victorious and to use your faith is by being born again. So he says, whatsoever is born of God. How many of you born of God? You're born of God. You qualify to walk in a victory that overcomes every situation. It begins with the new birth. Now, Jesus said in John 16, 33, it, it, it almost sounds strange in today's culture. But he said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world and you can overcome the world, the world system. Don't be concerned about the tribulation. Don't be concerned about the culture and what's going on. I got so tired of hearing Joe Namath on his TV commercial for Medicare. How many of you know who Joe Namath is? Broadway Joe, quarterback for the New York Jets, and then he became an actor. And he's selling Medicare insurance. And he saw, uh, always was saying last year, I'm playing it safe just like you. I'm, I'm at home. I'm playing it safe. I'm staying home. Well, I looked it up on the internet because a lot of people apparently didn't believe his commercial. He's not staying at home. And it says he's an actor and he's paid about a million bucks a year to do these commercials. But he said during these trying and uncertain times, and I got so tired of hearing that. If you know the Bible, if you know the word, if you know who you are in Christ, these are not uncertain times. There are bumps in the road, but we know exactly what's going to happen because we know what the Word of God says. So I'm going to talk to you just a few minutes this morning about some of the signposts along the road. The victory that overcomes the world is our faith in Christ and what He did for us, what He gave to us, and what He expects of us. Faith is active. It's not only what you believe, it's what you do with what you believe. Amen? We are not to faint. We are not to be weak. Proverbs 24, 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Well, there's adversity out there. All you have to do is turn on the TV, walk outside. You know there's adversity. You know there's Earthquakes, famines, pestilence. You know there's nation against nation, ethnicity against ethnicity. You know that there are conflicts. You know that there's plagues, there's wars, rumors of war. You know all these things are out there, but you're not to faint. You're not to be weak. And you're not to throw in the towel. You're not to run off. Um, there's a picture that I want to show you, and, and we have to be resilient. And resilience means to be overcomer or to adjust to change. Uh, as a pastor, I would go to the hospital and visit people. And I remember one day I walked by the conference room in this particular hospital, and I saw a sign out there, and they were holding a conference inside, teaching the nurses and staff. And the sign said, um, how to learn, it didn't say it this way, but it's, it, it said how to learn to live with and how to cope with cancer. That was the, the seminar they were teaching. And I walked on and I began to think about that more and more, how to cope with cancer, how to cope. They were actually teaching you and training you, which is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, but it, when you read the scriptures, God does not expect us to cope with cancer. To, to cope means to learn to live with. And when you overcome, and, and this is the way the Lord explained it to me, when you, when you cope with a force that's coming against you, it's a stalemate, it's a standoff. You're just, you're just there. Equal amount of pressure, equal amount of pressure. But to overcome a circumstance, the circumstance is applying pressure. But to overcome means there's a greater pressure than the pressure coming against you. 
and it moves that opposing force out of your life. You get healed, you get delivered. The miracle takes place. The financial need is met. Well, I, I love history and my father grew up during the Great Depression. He was one of the greatest generation like Tom Brokaw wrote in his book. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what'd you do when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? I said, where were you? He said, I was a freshman at Little Rock Junior College, which is now University of Arkansas at Little Rock. I said, what were you doing? He said, I was studying civil engineering, 18 years old. And we heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Didn't have instant communication like you do today. You had to wait a few days to make sure that it was right. It was over the radio. I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I did what we all did. We all went down and enlisted. I went to officer's training uh, school and uh, shipped out. And, and, you know, he was in the war for two or three years and then came home, rebuilt America. That's what the greatest generation did. Amen. And uh, I, of course, I was very, very proud of my dad and I followed in his shoes. I couldn't, I couldn't wait till I got to be 18 so I could register for the draft. Now, you might think that's crazy. But being raised in those war years, we experienced things that no other generation uh, has experienced today. And uh, we learned from it. We had a patriotism. Did you know that I have a lexicon at home? I call it World War II lexicon. Did you know that all through the war years, the word victory was used for just about everything that the government did? They had victory parades. They had, uh, the, <laughs> I don't know how to say this. They even had victory women. These were women that were not married that would make themselves available as companions for soldiers when they came home on leave. Now, I don't know who chaperoned that, but anyway, it was a it was a service that was provided to our servicemen. We had victory gardens, Secretary of Edu Agriculture. Uh, all the farmers were raising food for the war effort. So they asked everybody to plant their own vegetable gardens to feed their family. I remember, and, and we had coupons. You couldn't buy gas, sugar. Uh, it was all rationed. And it didn't matter about the gas because we didn't have a car, so we didn't need any gas. But I remember sometimes when the milk bottle would get low, mama would go over to the hydrant and turn the water on and fill the milk jug back up. And it was what you call homemade skim milk. <laughs> so those were hard years. During the Great Depression, there was a, a photographer, I don't remember her name, but I read the story who was assigned by the government to travel around to all the work camps and take photographs. Now I'm talking about resilience. I'm talking about overcoming change. I was in the grocery store the other day and the clerk asked me, she said, Pastor Caldwell said, is this the new norm? Is this the way we're going to have to live forever? I said, no. <laughs> Gives you an opportunity to witness to them and tell them better days are ahead. Now, we might have to experience some of the same hiccups and bumps, but we're, we're not confined to living uh, the way uh, things are in the world. We're overcomers. Uh, this is the victory that overcomes the world by our faith. Amen. And uh, they took pictures, and there's one picture that has just resonated with me, and I, I, I kept a copy of it because it, it inspires me. And um, I, I want to share this picture with you, if you can put it up on the screen. Anybody ever seen this picture? Several of you have. Well, let me tell you about this woman. Her name is Florence Owen Thompson. How, how old do you think she is right, right there in that picture? Like 32. Yeah, well, you've read the book. She's, she's 32 years old. She had seven children when she and her husband left um, 
they, they, her family was Cherokee Indian, and they came from North Carolina to Oklahoma. And when she got to Oklahoma, her husband, uh, I'm sorry, when she got to California, her husband died. They had seven children, and she remarried and had two more. She had nine children. She was 32 years old, and she lived in the back of a wagon with a tent across the top of it. I don't have those pictures, but this was the picture that the government chose to remind people uh, of the survival attitude, the overcoming attitude, the victorious attitude that people developed. Now, she worked as a migratory worker in California. She picked cotton and peas for 16 hours a day. And she did that. Uh, her family grew and then grew up. And I have a picture of her and her family. Uh, she lived into her 90s. But she is the face of adversity. She is the face <laughs> of resilience. And she just kept on going. Lost her husband. She raised all nine children. In the photograph I have of her and her, her kids, the, all the kids are standing around her. So they all lived. They all survived. Now that generation experienced things. Thank you. You can take that down now. That generation experienced situations that we haven't experienced just due to the time. Uh, Hitler was uh, bound and determined to create a superior race. He was out to kill six million Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals, and he was attempting to do it. One of his generals came up with a better way to dispose of the bodies because just shooting them in the back of the head and throwing them in a ditch wasn't fast enough. So the final solution was to build these uh, crematories and, and uh, gas them and kill them and burn them, put their ashes in a, in a, a ditch somewhere. And his, his goal, because he was demon-possessed, his goal uh, was to eradicate the Jews off the face of the earth. But we've had other dictators that made Hitler look like a piker. Joseph Stalin killed 30 million of his own people. Mao Zedong killed 60 million of his own people. And you know this, but I'm going to throw this challenge down. America has killed 63 million of its citizens. If we continue to kill unborn babies at the rate we're going now, our prayers and cries to God to save this country are going to fall on deaf ears because God's going to say, you want me to save your nation, but you're not willing to ki quit killing the babies. Mother Teresa said that any nation that kills the unborn loses its soul. Well, that's about happening right now. Ronald Reagan wrote a book in 1983 called uh, Conscience, uh, Abortion, The Conscience of a Nation. So if you keep killing babies, you lose your conscience. We've, we don't know what's right and what's wrong. The reason our government can't solve the problems that it created is because according to Proverbs 1 and Romans 1, they've been turned over to a reprobate mind, which is a mind void of judgment. And let me say this, when you pray for your president, then you should. <clears throat> there are people in Congress that would like to invoke the 25th Amendment and remove President Biden from office on the grounds of incompetence. But the 25th Amendment does not allow people to be removed from office on the grounds of incompetence. Only unwillingness to serve and unable to serve. If you could remove politicians on the grounds of incompetence, we should have started a long time ago. <laughs> but let me tell you how to pray for your president. The Bible says that we're to pray for those in authority. Why? So we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And then it tells you how to pray for, your, for those in authority. Number one, you're to pray that they be saved. Pray that they get saved, born again. And two, that they get the knowledge of the truth. 
Pray that they get saved. Don't, don't pray for a tree to fall on them. Pray for them to be saved. And pray that they will come to the knowledge of the truth. And when I was praying uh, uh, for the president one day, the, the Lord just kind of dropped this in my spirit. I'll share it with you. Anybody here, you don't have to raise your hands, have a member of your family or a spouse or a child or a parent or grandparents or friends or whatever that have had dementia and Alzheimer's. It's a terrible thing that happens to them. Uh, one of my jobs that I had in college, it was I took one semester off. I was a psychology major and I worked in a mental institution because I wanted to have firsthand experience working with people that were suffering from mental illness. And I saw people that had dementia and Alzheimer's. And I watched people walk around not knowing where they were, who they were, where they were going, what they were doing. They couldn't remember from one minute to the next. And if you see people like that, I want you to know they know that something's not right. They're not totally unaware of their condition. But they're locked in emotionally. They're hurting. They're struggling to remember, to think, to perform. But they can't. Their families suffer. Their husbands, their wives suffer. Their children suffer. Our president is suffering. And the Lord showed me the compassion that he wanted me to have towards him and towards his condition. It may never be admitted, but believe me, he knows what incapacities he is suffering right now. So we need to be more compassionate and pray for him to be healed, to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you say, well, Pastor Caldwell, what if we do that and nothing happens, nothing changes? But the scripture says, God will reward you for just praying for him. So he'll give you a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and honesty. Amen. Let me define a few terms uh, because we're running out of time. Uh, how much time do I have? 20 minutes? Is that correct? Okay. If I'm reading everything uh, just right. I was doing a mile high conference for Marilyn Hickey several years ago in, uh, in Denver and the coordinator of the event <laughs> Uh, came in the green room and told me, he said, now here's the way the service goes and here's the praise and worship and the product offer and uh, Marilyn's whatever she has and blah, blah, blah. And said, when then we'll receive an offering, he said, and you'll have 20 minutes. I said, well, what if I'm not through in 20 minutes? He said, you will be. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be. <laughs> when, when the clock runs out, uh, exit because I've got another class to teach. Okay. Um, global reset. Have you ever heard that term global reset? Uh, you haven't? Where have you been? What, what, what uh, social media pad have you been watching? Globalism. Have you heard that term? Globalism. Global reset. Well, uh, they're trying to tell us that we're in global reset right now. Uh, a pastor friend of mine, I, had, I heard him say on television the other day that we're right smack dab in the middle of World War III because of all the things that are happening. Well, that's not true. We are not in the middle of World War III. We are not in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, the seals aren't being poured out. The horsemen have not started riding and measuring out wrath and vengeance. We are not in World War III. Hilton Sutton wrote a book by that title, World War III in 1982, but he describes the World War III that he's talking about. It's Russia's invasion of Israel as they invade Israel from the north. And this is in Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39. The Bible says that Russia, Gog, Magog, thinks an evil thought. They say Israel now, it's the same devil that's trying to kill off the Jewish people that Hitler, uh, you know, tried to do 
and the same uh, devil, uh, the Antichrist, spirit of Antichrist, is still trying to destroy Israel, still trying to destroy Jerusalem, still trying to destroy the Jewish people. And so it says that they will think an evil thought. And they'll say, <clears throat> we see walls, I mean cities without walls, n bars, uh, no security. And of course, this is all talking about the first half of the tribulation period. And it says that uh, peace and safety, and that will be their clue to invade Israel from the north. Now they're gearing up for that now. They don't know what the Bible says, but there are Russian military bases in Syria, just north of the Golan Heights. And we were in Israel uh, May 14, 2018 for the dedication of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. And uh, we got to go down to the seaport in Haifa. And I, having served in the Navy for six years, two years at sea on a destroyer, I wanted to see their vessels. And the captain let me go aboard the ship, very heavily armed. And I said, what, what does Israel need a Navy for? He said, oh, the Russians are passing by our coast looking for soft water ports. They're looking for easy entrance into our nation. So this invasion from the north, Gog, Magog, Russia. Now, this is not the same invasion or war uh, that'll take place at the end of the tribulation period. And I know I'm talking about some things that probably some of you have never heard or never studied, but it's time you started uh, finding out. Jeannie has a syllabus that she wrote called A Study of Revelation. But the global reset that we're hearing about now is, is not, it does not take place until after the church is removed, caught up to meet Jesus in the air. Then the great tribulation will begin. And that's when a global reset will take place. The global reset begins after the departure of the church. What we're experiencing now is perilous times, not World War III. In fact, there's no mention in the Old or New Testament with that phrasing World War III. Uh, Hilton was referring to the invasion of Israel from the north um, by, by Russia. In fact, if you look up our first two world wars, World War I, World War II, World War I, I think, was 1914. World War II was uh, 1939, 40, 41, and um, went through 45. There were only 30 nations, approximately 30 nations, that were involved in each of those world wars. So when you think of a World War III, you think of the whole world at war. Well, the whole world at war in one and two was only about 30 nations. And a lot of them were just knee-jerk reactions. One nation would attack another nation, and, you know, so they, another nation would attack another nation. And, and if you've been keeping up with what happened in Afghanistan and all of the military actions that we've had over the years as, as a nation, the United States, and you think, what are we going to do? The Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS, and ISIS-K, and all the... Go back and reread Genesis when it talked about Ishmael being born, and it describes Ishmael as a wild man, and every hand shall be against him. All of these terrorist groups are tribal in nature. They war against each other all the time. So what's happening over there is not anything new. And if you study the history of Native Americans, you'll find that the Native American tribes did the same thing. They warred with each other. I read the biography of Sitting Bull, and he said and he was a holy man. Uh, you know, he, he, he told the Sioux Nation at, at uh, Custer's Last Stand, he said, I, I have been uh, in presence of the Great Spirit, is what he called. And he said, he said, you can win this war but don't take any scalps or a curse will come upon your whole nation. Well, they did take scalps. They won them uh, the battle of Little Bighorn and they did take scalps and the curse has been on their tribes ever since. 
He said, if we needed a wife, we'd go steal one from another tribe. If we needed horses or food, we'd go steal it from another tribe. That's tribal warfare. Well, what you see in the Middle East is the same thing. It's tribal. And it's going to continue. And go to Matthew 24, and I want you to see Jesus is teaching on the Mount of Olives, and he's teaching his disciples. And he's telling them what is coming. Matthew chapter 24, and look at verse 3. Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. That's the first thing he said. They wanted a sign. I have a book that I wrote called Seasons, Signs, and Spiritual Things. And it, I don't despise prophesying, and I'm not contending with prophesying, but prophecy and signs is not how God's children are supposed to be led. Bible says that we're to be led by the Spirit. The sons of God are to be led by the Spirit of God, not by signs and by prophecy. Besides that, you know, in our culture today, there have been a lot of false prophecies. There are a lot of pseudo-prophets and wannabe apostles. You know, if you were in the Old Testament days and you prophesied something that didn't come to pass, they'd kill you. I mean, your, your, <laughs> your ministry was over. <laughs> but today, the prophets won't even admit that they missed it. So you can't go by what somebody prophesied or a sign. You know, the disciples went to another in Matthew 12, and they said, Master, we would see a sign from you. He said, there'd be no signs given to this evil and adulterous generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he ministered to them uh, along those lines. And Jonas was a, a foreshadow of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he said, and the preaching of Jonas. And Jesus told the disciples here, he said uh, in verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom should be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But he said, first, don't let anybody deceive you. Well, that means you've got to know the word for yourself. And he goes on and he says, Many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, have we heard of wars and rumors of wars? Yeah. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Oh, underline that. All these things must come to pass. And then he goes on and tells you some more things. <laughs> he said, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Famines, pestilences, that's viruses, earthquakes, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. Say that out loud. The beginning of sorrows. That's a metaphor for a woman in travail getting ready to give birth. Everything that we're experiencing today in our culture, this is not the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. God is not pouring out a virus to get our attention. He is not chastening us with pestilence. If you go over to Hebrews, it says that, you know, you've not been appointed to wrath. The wrath of God is going to be poured out all right. And Israel is going to receive the brunt of it for rebellion, disobedience, and rejection of Messiah. But it's not time for that yet. We're still in the age of grace. We're still in the last part of the church age. And our job is to preach the gospel to the world. Our job is to be salt and light. Stephen Covey wrote a book several years ago. He was an author, a lecturer, and I liked it. It says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. You just keep the main thing, the main thing, and you'll be all right. Don't get drawn off to a ditch over here or a ditch over here. God called us to change people. He called us to reach people, to tell people about Jesus. The gospel of grace is Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose and he was seen. That's what got me here. 
What got you here? When I was sitting in the old Ryman Auditorium and Jimmy, Jimmy Snow, son of Hank Snow, uh, came up there and preached five minutes. I went, I didn't go to hear Jimmy Snow. I didn't even know there was going to be preaching. This was the Friday Night Opry. I went to hear Johnny Cash. I didn't, I didn't know there was going to be preaching. But after John and June sang, gave their testimony, then Jimmy Snow came out and he preached five minutes. And he said, if you need a new life, Jesus is the only way for you to get that new life. And I was up in the balcony. The Ryman Auditorium holds 3,000 people. Jeannie was with me. Now, she was saved. I wasn't. We got married. She said, are you a Christian? I said, of course I'm a Christian. I'm not a heathen. I go to church. And I was born in America. <laughs> that's pretty dumb, but that's the way a lot of people think. They think because they're born in America, they're a Christian. You're not, you're not a Christian because you're born in America anymore. You'd be a car if you go stand out in the garage. <laughs> And so I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I was born again, three months later, filled with the Holy Ghost. And I told her our life's fixing to change. Little did I know how much, because I was at the time a salesman for a wholesale liquor company. I sold liquor to all of the liquor stores, bars, package stores, hotels, lounges, nightclubs. And after I got born again and filled with the Spirit, and I was my best customer, and I got delivered, <laughs> I got delivered from my product and my job. And I would go into the liquor store and I'd have my briefcase and I'd go in the liquor store and I'd say, I got two kinds of spirits. Which one do you want to hear about first? <laughs> so you can, you can be salt and you can be light. That's what you're here for. Don't get caught up in all the things that are taking place in the culture. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Okay, let's close this up. Uh, Jesus went on, because I want to make this point to you. Now, don't respond to this uh, until I'm through, because you might embarrass yourself. <laughs> Jesus said, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then he tells you of the other things that are going to come to pass. Well, when the pandemic broke out, let's say March of 2020, and I tell you what, the word of faith people, I mean, they rallied, they prayed, they cursed the virus. They prophesied over the virus. They fasted. They interceded. And nothing changed. So I asked the Lord, I said, okay, what's, what's the deal here? We're faith people. We're overcomers. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I said, why haven't we been able to stop this virus? He said, go back and read Matthew 24 to 6. I said, these things must come to pass. You can't stop these things from coming to pass, but you can stop them from coming on you. You can stop them from coming on you and your family, but you can't stop them from coming to pass. Jesus' first coming was a set time. His second coming is a set time. The rapture of the church is a set time, except this exception. Nobody knows when it is. But we can look at the scriptures and we can ascertain the second coming. And we can read Isaiah and we can read about the first coming. It was prophesied. And we can figure all that out with scripture. But God has left this catching way of the church um, so that nobody would know. Because he wants you to keep on doing the main thing. He don't want you slacking off, say, oh, well, hallelujah. Jesus is coming next Tuesday at noon. Let's all, and you know, he, he doesn't want that. He said, you're supposed to occupy. You're supposed to work. You're supposed to be looking for him. Now, when the church is caught up and taken out, and, and I, I think I'll close with this. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians, let, let's go over there and read it so you'll, you'll see for yourself. Second Thessalonians talks about uh, when the church is removed. And, and you know it's the church. You can tell it's the church. And it, and it shows you what's going to happen after the departure of the church. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse uh, let's go to verse three. Let no man deceive you 
by any means. Well, that coincides with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Let no man deceive you for that day, talking about the day of the Lord, the, the second coming, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Another translation says the departure of the church. Now, I know people have different opinions and ideas and doctrines, but I'm just going to read what the scripture says. Except there come a falling away first, the departure of the church, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, that's, the, that's Satan. He's, he, he wanted to be God. If you go back and reread uh, his departure from heaven, he was kicked out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven because he wanted to be God. He rebelled against God. He still wants to be God. He still hates God. He hates you. He hates Israel. He hates the Jews. That's where all of the stealing, killing, and destruction is coming from. So he, he wants to be worshipped. So he's sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Now you know that withholdeth that he might reveal in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Spirit of Antichrist is already here. It's been here for decades. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The he that he's talking about is the body of Christ. I used to think it was the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is going to stay here after the church is departed. The Holy Spirit's going to stay here to empower and anoint the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. And you go over to Revelation and you see standing before the throne of God, worshiping the Lamb, you see an innumerable, unnumbered amount of people worshiping God. And the elder says, who are these people? And where did they come from? And the angel says, these are they that came out of the tribulation period. They've had their garments washed by the blood of the Lamb. That means there's a whole people group that are going to go through that tribulation. Some of them are going to be martyred because they're going to refuse to take the mark of the beast. Well, what was, that t what was that TV program, Saved by the Bell? Or something? Well, I'll just leave it there with you. For... You can go on our website or... God bless y'all. Thank you. Boy, when you're done, you're done. They cut the mic off. You can't hear nothing. <laughs>